So good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is Sagar, and uh, me and Ashish will be presenting this topic on uh, how is Visual Studio Code and the combination of Python uh, is the next level of awesomeness, right? We all are developers here, and uh, we basically are from Microsoft. We work with the partner team, and we are both solution architects. Uh, we have a special liking for uh, AI and machine learning as well. That's why we are here amongst you guys. So let's get started. So if you just see, those are our Twitter handles. Uh, Ashish uh, A underscore and Sagar JMS. That's our Twitter handles if you'd like to tweet to us after the session. So let's see, you know, uh, what has been Microsoft's OSS journey to, till today, right? I mean, uh, which drastically changed after 2014. .NET Framework used to be a core product. And we also outsourced that, uh, sorry, open source that into something called as .NET Core, right? And if you see, that is where our journey actually started when we put .NET Core on the open source platform, uh, which is on GitHub. And then we, 2015, we realized that uh, uh, since the advent of the cloud, which is Microsoft Azure, we al also realized that people are not going to only write .NET code. They're going to write Python code. They're going to write uh, Rust code. They're going to write Go code. They're going to write Node.js, TypeScript, JavaScript, everything. So we wanted a IDE which would, which would be number one class cross-platform, lightweight, and also extends the capability uh, rather than just begin development editor to a debugger or you know an ecosystem of sorts that is where we thought about vs code and then you know you the ecosystem has grown so much because of extensions of the contributions uh, it's really touching new heights and then in 2016 we realized uh, we released the first version of our dotnet core product and you know uh, we also announced sql server on linux you know so a lot of cool things going on fast forward to 2018 which was last year um, you know half of our uh, we're trending towards a lot of our virtual machines on Azure running uh, Linux, uh, you know, we acquired GitHub to, um, and then we also have a lot of cool thing going on with VS Code. Just in a matter of three to four years, uh, it has reached as a number one uh, ID in the market, right? For all the developers, it's not only a certain set of developers, but all the developers. So this is how our open source journey started because Python being an open source, it's really important for us to come and tell you uh, what our journey has been. And if you see, uh, I was looking at the Stack Overflow insights from last year, 2018, and um, over 34% of, of the developer community had said uh, uh, that Visual Studio Code was their number one ID of choice. And then I happened to look up the 2019 survey, which actually came out already, and 50% of you, the developers, actually said they, uh, Visual Studio Code is their favorite ID uh, of choice. Yeah, so thanks for that. And the ecosystem keeps growing on. So that is the reason uh, if you're a Python developer with combination of VS Code and uh, our cloud platform, you can do really cool things. You know, uh, the number of problems which Python developers face, not from a capability perspective, but everything outside of the ML model, right? Versioning. Uh, hosting, scaling, uh, DevOps, now called as MLOps. That is where we, with our IDE and our uh, platform, come in and really help you guys out, right? And we also have a booth outside if you want to come uh, chat with us about your scenario. So just, you know, uh, just a minute about uh, why is uh, Azure's machine learning really helpful for developers, right? Uh, if you see, we on, on the first line, we have a lot of uh, APIs, as you will, to make ready-made pre-built API calls, right, to cognitive services, which are our AI, uh, AI services. So you don't need to really write code, uh, but you can leverage our APIs if you are in the region and you want to do rapid development. Then we have a lot of tools which are very familiar to you, like you, know, uh, you can use your uh, Jupyter Notebooks with IDE, uh, which is VS Code, or, and you can bring it to Azure, and we'll give you an environment to to, to let you not first maybe install a, a Jupyter server and you know do the, all the plumbing and managing. We'll just give you a ready-made Jupyter uh, you know, server out of the box, and then you can use uh, your environment right there. Obviously, Visual Studio Code will see a lot of demos, uh, and, and trust me, this is my last slide. And after that, we'll jump right into the demos, which me and Ashish will take over. And we do support a lot of popular frameworks. You know, being on the cloud, uh, it's imperative that people are doing different things. Some of you uh, might be developing for TensorFlow. Some of uh, you might be developing for PyTorch. Um, and, and you might have heard about Onyx. So it's really important that you as developers be, be really successful on, on the cloud while using our platform. Hence, we support the plethora of these 
host of services which really makes your life really easier uh, you guys are the best in writing python code and what we bring to the table is to help you become more productive how can your platform how can your code or how can your um, uh, model be scalable how can your model uh, be versioned right how can your model be uh, you know let's say the different versions can be hosted on to the cloud without you having to really learn some of the technologies which are around and go deep like for example how much of how much of docker do you need to learn right maybe a little bit but not all of it because you know hey it's a world where microservices are becoming really really mainstream and the next two lines are you know the hardware and uh, what what is the ecosystem of services that we have today on the cloud which really helps you to uh, run your models very efficiently and the biggest thing is in the bottom right uh, the capabilities are very similar to whatever you would try to run on the edge like your mobile is an edge my mobile is an edge and a raspberry pi is an edge to the super powerful cloud we're sort of trying to streamline the capability across right so you being a python developer uh, you will come across a scenario whether you're working for a company or you're an individual that sometime you wanted to need a you know your let's say your inference model uh, on a mobile very limited resources right uh, so how do we enable you to do that with our sdk and obviously you can run the training on the cloud which requires a lot of gpus cpus and fpga uh, but the similar capabilities are available to you on the cloud so we we're trying to cover end to end spectrum of that right so demo time as i promised that was my last slide i won't bore you with a lot of slides so let's see what do we ha have here right so basically you know this is vs code and uh, there are some cool features that i want to display uh, to you right here so for example this is a very simple file right it it doesn't have anything i'm just trying to uh, print a number but one good thing i wanted to show you is the intelligence capabilities uh, we invested a lot of a lot of energy into something called as a python server and when you go to the output of vs code you can see there's a python language server which the extension has installed so you know when you use vs code uh we give you a python language server you know which which is in the backend and then it actually tries to give you intelligence like what kind of intelligence right for example uh i'll move here a is just number here and then i say you know a dot something it gives me an integer specific properties right and maybe i just initialize a later to you know let's say something called as a string right and i just say server so without even saving the file it's going to uh you know give me an intelligence saying that you actually change something and then the jupiter server tries to run some modeling so it's an ai within an ai and then tries to give you very specific recommendations to with respect to your code so this is where you know uh, this is just a tip of the iceberg where you get good intelligence so that you can write code faster uh, if you write your own functions you hit f12 it will go traverse and go take you to the function as well right so that was one part now the other part of the story is how do you run this you know i can come here write python and then you know this is integrated terminal and run or what i can do since it's already detected i have a python code i can just right click and say run in the python code and you know that's my output right here right that's the number that is trying to print so very simple for you to go and you know we also have debugging capabilities so if you see i have a um, i have a breakpoint here i can go and start debugging so it's actually going to ask me okay what configuration do you want right and it's going to immediately go and start debugging for you right there in the id so it's more more than just an editor it's it's an ecosystem now let's go further and try to see some other things that i've done now this was this is python 3.7 running on my own machine uh, you know uh, directly at the root now i went ahead and sort of took the liberty of installing uh, a virtual environment and in that virtual environment i i sort of went ahead and uh, you know i'm trying to go do jupyter notebooks right so if i come here okay perfect now what i'm going to try to do here is show you a little bit more advanced capability of the python extension for visual studio code right uh, this is simple you know uh, uh, it will try to print what are the path variables available to my code uh, what i'm going to also show you now how does how can i make it into a a notebook right and jupyter notebook is more interactive so what i'm going to do is just insert a code snippet here uh, which actually you know shows you a a a, a matplotlib uh, you know graph so I, if i just run this you will see that you know on the screen this is a graph that i see right very simple five line of code but you know 
uh, real world programs are much more complex and you require a continuous sync between let's say the graphs because you know you'll use complex things like data frames and uh, you know and pandas frame and stuff like that so what we thought was you know why not give you something cool so if i want to change this again to let's say 20 i have to uh, you know maybe save this file i have to I have to save this file um, and run again right and then it will show me okay this is now how my new graphs uh, is going to look like right I think I did a typo there maybe okay I forgot the comma okay let me go back a little bit So this was my original snippet, right? And, and then if I just try to do, you know, 20, wow, something's funny happening with my mouse here. Okay, let me go back. So I think there's some problem. So let's say the capability I wanted to show is you keep changing that and then, you know, you have to pop up the uh, output again. What I wanted to show you is, you know, how you can instantly bring up a, a Jupyter notebook kind of environment here by just typing a hash and double percent and then it gives you an option to say you know run the cell so what happens is in the same window on the right hand side you get an interactive Python window running right and if you see right here oh yes this is this is how I can now toggle between the two windows I can just close this and then see in the side saying that this is how I can actually work together and then convert my plain Python code into an interactive Python code right and then uh, you are you are free to sort of you know toggle between the, these two things as you go along at any point in time you want to write more code or if, if you want to you know uh, not do these things you can just remove this you know and the shell goes away right because it says okay no you're not you're you're not using the interactive shell anymore and then you don't need it the other way of uh, converting something to a, uh, a to a interactive python notebook is you can actually run the current file in an interactive window so again it will go and pop up the same way in the previous versions of uh, our, our python tooling we didn't have this option but today we, we do have this option so if you see first it will try to print the path um, and then it will also try to show the graph so it's very easy for you to toggle between you know back and forth right so that was another demo of uh, you know how you how you do stuff with visual studio code if you haven't actually used it and the last thing i wanted to show you is uh, you know the last thing is how do you run uh, 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 you know python in a serverless fashion right when you write a python code you need to have some machine somewhere right but serverless is the new new mantra in the microservices world so what we actually give you is a way to run this uh, in a serverless so if you see i have a python code uh, right here in the in the trigger function and this is just going to take you know uh, it's not Flask, it's not any of the frameworks, it's Microsoft Azure functions. It's just trying to do something and I can just package this up, put it on the cloud without having to create a machine. So what this actually does is helps me, uh, you know, run Python code in a serverless fashion without having to install anything. And this is the local emulator that I'm running, right? So if you see, uh, so much of, so much of inbuilt tooling that you get right here right and on top of it i can just go and start browsing the api right so i can just click this uh, it goes into the i it will give an error because i haven't passed a parameter yet so if i go to the end if i go to the end and say name equal to sj and it will start printing it out you know all running locally and a great debugging support because uh, once you come back to the vs code you see all the logging right here so Python plus plus VS Code plus serverless uh, will make you do awesome things. So I'll be hanging around. This is end of my part of the demo. And Ashish will come and uh, tell you more about how uh, the ML side of things uh, looks much more better on um, on the tooling side with VS Code and Microsoft Azure. So Ashish, over to you. So good morning, everyone. Uh, you can hear me, right? OK, great. So good morning, my name is Achesh. I do the same stuff you know, as Sagar does. And uh, one thing that I'm not going to do today is you know, show you any slides. So we will directly get into the uh, demos here, right? So this is a function app that we just created, right? The Sagar talked about it. 
So what you can do is you can simply press F5 in VS Code and start running it. And you know, it does the usual stuff. It basically, uh, uh, so I have the functions runtime and the functions extensions, you know, installed in my VS Code. And that's what is actually making all this magic happen. So uh, my code is running locally and you know, you can test it out, you can do whatever uh, you want to do with your functions. It, like, you know, he showed it, you know, it's a pretty basic function, HTTP trigger, so that uh, what you can do is you can call it, uh, you know, in your applications using the uh, HTTP client, as simple as that, right? And how do you run it? You do the control click and you get this option here and it's expecting the name parameters. So let me, you know, just do this, right? We have already seen this demo, right? What we are going to do next is we are just going to uh, you know, extend it a little bit, right? So when Sagar was going through the slides, he talked about uh, the services like, you know, pre-built uh, AI models and as well as the ML services, right? Uh, so what we're going to do is, you know, we are going to take a look at that, how do you take a plain vanilla function and try to infuse, you know, a little bit of pre-trained pre AIs into the function and, you know, get something more interesting going, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to change all my name parameters so to say a text, right? And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a little bit of technical liberty here and paste the snippet which is already there in the keyboard, uh, uh, in my uh, clipboard, right? And then what I'm going to do is I am just going to print the output that I'm going to get from the API calls. So what's happening here is that I already have the uh, Azure Cognitive Service called Tech Text Analytics provisioned, you know, right? So what I'm doing is I'm just creating an endpoint here. I have my key mentioned right here, and I'm going to change it after the session so that you, you know, you don't make a note of it. I get billed, you know, for that. So, uh, so that's what is happening, and I'm just printing out the fun this function here, right? So I'm just going to change this text to sentiments because that's what my output is, right? And I'm just going to run it right here. And then uh, the function that I was just running, you know, a few seconds ago is going to be doing some additional stuff and which is to basically make a call to the text analytics and uh, do the, you know, bunch of the AI stuff on it and shows the output. So let's try that. Let me launch it in my browser. Right, so right now it doesn't have anything. So I'm going to do this and say, right? Then what happens is it's actually making a call to the text analytics API, which you can come here and also see here. And I did not get an output here. Wow. Okay. So uh, I see one error here, right? So the name request is not defined here. So what did I miss here is that I have not installed the uh, requests module here. So what I need to do is either I can come back here and add it to my requirements file, right? Which is going to be as simple as this, or I come back here and I show you the function that I have already put anything and everything is running. So let me run that function and show you how it works. Right, same stuff. It passes through the requirements.txt, installs all my uh, modules, libraries, and then everything is ready. Right, so I've got two functions in this particular project, and I'm just going to run this one. And before it shows me an error, I'm just going to type something which looks like a uh, review for a hotel room kind of thing, right? And this time, that should work, right? So this is my uh, output that is coming from the text analytics API, and I'm just printing, printing it raw. So just to make it, you know, a little bit more easier to the eyes, I'm going to go to jasonlin.com and put it here, and validate. Now what's happening here is, you see the output here, right? So the 10 sentiment in this particular text that I had, which was, this one, I would recommend this place. And this is the one I didn't want to show, only for my enemies, you know? Yeah, it was a okay. fun we were actually, you know, doing. Sorry to do that, but now since we have the output, let's go through that. So if you take a look at the sentiment here, right? It shows, you know, it's a mixed sentiment thing, right? So I've, we've got, you know, 50% of the document, which is basically the entire review, 
uh, towards the positive side and the 49% of this text was actually uh, negative side, right? That's what we see. If there were any neutral sentences, we would have seen that as well. And what is happening furthermore is that, you know, it's actually breaking down the uh, text that I gave, gave to the API into sentences. And then it's giving me the score of the positivity and negativity here, right? So you can see the first sentence is 99% positive. And the second one is actually 98% negative. So that's what the making the entire complete document score as something, you know, which is 50% positive and 50% negative, right? So that's what it did. Now that's one example. What we should uh, also do is let's take a look at uh, another function that I already have running and let me just show you the code here. So let me close this one. And what I'm doing in this one is that I am calling another uh, pre-built AI service called computer vision here, right? And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to take this URL, which is basically an image, and I'm going to do the same stuff, and this is already running. So I'm just going to change this to the second function and change the parameter to URL. And give the path to that image URL, which I have already copied in, uh, you know, from my code. So what it is doing this time is actually making call to the computer vision API and trying to analyze the image to fetch the, you know, information that we can have, you know. Uh, and let's take a look at that also. So again, same stuff, JSON lint, and right. So here, it is doing a bunch of things. You know, it's trying to detect the. Let me, you know, walk you through the code a little bit here. Right, so these are the four or four or five, you know, different kinds of analysis that we are doing. We are trying to, you know, describe the image. We are trying to extract the categories of the contents that we have in the image, then colors, brands, faces, and objects, right? So if you take a look at the output here, right, we have categories people, because in that photo, which is this one, right, this is Brandon Burns, and then he's obviously talking in a conference. So we see that, you know, that it was actually able to categorize this image as people. Then it did the color stuff. It also trying to, you know, it also built a description for us. And then we have the faces. So we also did the face detection, and that is the location and, you know, the gender of the person that we detected there. And then we also have the objects, right? So there's a bottle, there's a laptop, and there's a person here, right? So that we all, you know, can definitely see here. What it is also doing additionally is that it also detected a brand there uh, in the image, you know, which is Apple. Should have taken a different image, uh, but yeah, you have an Apple MacBook here, right? So that you see here. Now let's try this and uh, let me take another image because what I did is, did is, you know, that I want to show you the celebrity recognition that we do from this API, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take this same API call and give it a different image right now. Right, this is the output. Let's do the same stuff here. Right, we have everything, you know, things like that. And then we have got the description, right? You can all read that now. And then there's also celebrated recognition, so we have this. And then Let's go and try to look at the image that I actually gave it, and that's this one, right? And then it also does, based on this photo, I mean, we all know about him, right? But let's do this thing. Uh, where is that output? So we did the celebrity recognition anyway here, right? But what we did also in the, we were also trying to analyze the faces that we detected, detect in the image, right? So that's what we did. And if you come here and take a look at this, you know, this will come as surprising, but if you look at the photo, right? It doesn't look, you know, very far-fetched, right? So that's what it is doing. Now that was the pre-built AIs that we did, right? And then uh, the other thing that we also do, I mean, you can also do with the VS Code is actually, you know, take it a step further and start utilizing it when you are, you know, uh, actually building the custom models, right? So unfortunately, we are, you know, slightly out of time. So I think it's time for a question and answer. But one thing I would like to show you is the, okay, I have to change my resolution.
Okay. That's the one. So what you can do is you can actually use the uh, VS Code also, VS Code along with the Azure Machine Learning Service to also do your team data science projects, which actually is, you know, uh, your complete life cycle of a data science project. You know, like you do the application life cycle management, you can also do the data science life cycle management using the VS Code. And uh, we're short of time, so I couldn't show you the demo, but you can do things like, you know, training your models locally or in the cloud register your models with the service, you know, host it in a single place, analyze how your models are performing across, you know, uh, everybody's, you know, uh, data science environment in a single place to understand which model works, uh, you know, better or not, and all that stuff. So with that, uh, thanks. Any questions, if we have the time for, uh, please go ahead, you know, pick the mic and uh, let us know. And then we also have a booth outside, uh, the Microsoft booth. So, you know, you can always come and talk to us there as well. Um, do you have any extensions that you'd recommend? Um, so what kind of development do you do? I mean, Python. Python, right? So uh, there's a Python extension. So if you... Yeah, uh, other than the main Python extension and the language server, I mean, as a developer, do you recommend anything? Okay. So um, these are the two things that we have used so far. So we haven't, you know, needed anything else. But if you go there and, you know, search for Python here, you know, you have a bunch of these things, you know, that you can possibly find useful. So basically, you can use the uh, Azure uh, Functions extension as well, and the Azure extension as well. So those are the two things that uh, will do a lot of work for you already. Right? So those are the official ones that we have, and we highly recommend that. Uh, not the only official ones. These are also the community-built uh, yeah, ones. A lot of them. Yeah. Hi. Um, so whatever you showed, uh, means I actually use VS Code for a lot of things. But the second part that you showed, it's just a REST API, right? I can yeah. do it in PyCharm, I can do it in anything. Anyway, yes. So, so what, uh, like how do you think uh, leveraging VS Code would help in that case? Uh, so in this case, you know, what you saw uh, using the functions extensions, I was actually running that code locally, right? So I mean, you can do that in PyCharm, but you know, if you want to push it, you know, you will have to basically use any uh, additional tools, you know, to do that. DevOps stuff there, right? So what I can do is, you know, I can come back to this code right here, right now, right here, and push it to my functions app. So it kind of gives you an end-to-end -end experience, you know, uh, developing locally, testing locally, and deploying it to your production. Yeah. Also, uh, the uh, Azure ML deep learning SDK and you know the Python SDK for uh, uh, VS Code that actually gives you a lot of flexibility. Where you know you are the you are the boss of the code, anyways. But the peripheral things, right, makes super easy for you to interact with the code. Uh, he was supposed to show that, but but I'm happy to run you through uh, on on the booth. Yeah. Uh, thanks, everyone. You've been wonderful audience. Thank you.